Hello and welcome to That's Wow. I'm Siarin, a nature guide and environmental educator. I'll be your host for this podcast series where we'll be talking to a variety of special guests about some wild and wonderful topics surrounding nature conservation in Singapore, our city in nature. That's Wow is brought to you by the National Park Spot. If you like our content, don't forget to show your support by hitting that follow button and giving us a five-star rating. In this episode on Youth Action, I'm very excited to speak with Steffi, who is a manager at MPAC's Wildlife Trade Branch, as well as Waikit, who is the co-founder of the CITES Global Youth Network with Steffi. As youths who are involved in the biodiversity conservation space, we'll be talking about our experiences collaborating locally and across the region, as well as the kinds of opportunity available for young people who are interested to contribute to conservation. Hi Steffi and Waikit. Hi, I'm Steffi. Hi, I'm Waikit. Okay, so how did it all begin? Can you share more about how you began your journeys in conservation and how do you get to where you are today? So I got interested in conservation when I first saw a photo of a nudie bank. They are these sea slugs, um, which are kind of snails without shells. And I was just so intrigued by the colours and I was like, whoa, like these things exist. And after that, then I got very interested in like learning and seeing marine life. And because of that, I enrolled in an environmental studies course for my university and over there I did a research project on the coral aquarium trade and then that's how I stumbled into the world and complex web of wildlife trade and that's where I did an internship at the wildlife trade department in N Parks and that's how I joined YSN and organized WWD's World Wildlife Day Regional Youth Symposium and all these experiences culminated into me wanting to do something for youths and wildlife trade. So with Waikit, I started the CITES Global Youth Network. How about you, Waikit? Well, my journey in conservation started out quite differently. I was doing project management in Singapore Poly, um, and I had the opportunity to fly to Japan for exchange. There were many topics I could choose from, but I gravitated towards natural disasters. And then I organized a youth model ASEAN conference, and again, I caught myself gravitating towards the Renewable Energy Committee. Small decisions I make with my head, big decisions I make with my heart. So I took a leap of faith and decided to apply to NUS Geography. There I took up the position of co-president at NUS Main Environmental CCA before embarking on an internship at MPAX as well. I went to wildlife management and community projects departments. MPAX gave me the opportunity to organize the inaugural World Wildlife Day Regional Youth Symposium during COVID and to attend CITES COP in Panama with the Singapore delegation. After that, I became an academic fellow for the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, where I joined 16 ASEAN friends in Hawaii to learn more about topics such as indigenous rights and environmental law. And now I'm in my final semester of NUS, and I co-founded the CITES Global Youth Network along with Steffi and the support of the Singapore government. So what about you, Xiaoyun? So I think for me, the stumble into like wildlife conservation all began with a night walk in a secondary forest in Singapore. Um, and from there, I just went on more walks and more hikes. Primarily, it started from like, I think wildlife photography because I was supporting my partner, Dennis, with his camera setup. He, at that point, had so many lights and diffusers and he hadn't figured out a way to hold everything together. So as we would spend like extended time with the creature in its environment, the prolonged experience of observing the creature actually like diffused all my fears. So I remember this this time we were looking at a Waggler's Pit Viper and it's the female. So it's like full form adult. It's like very thick. It's like one meter long. So I think once I got over that fear over that Pit Viper, I think everything else just like float and curiosity uh, replaced fear. Uh, as I speak Bahasa as my third language, I still have an interest in understanding Southeast Asian cultures and society. So that really motivates my personal interest to continue conservation work in the region. So I'd like to know, like, where has your work in conservation taken you? For example, you could share about your experiences with on-the-ground work, encounters with local communities or other inspiring individuals or projects based overseas that were meaningful to you. For me, most recently, I guess my work in conservation has taken us to um, start CITES Global Youth Network, which is CGYN for short. And we started that because we realised that there aren't many youths in this space in CITES meetings or who even know what like the acronym of CITES stands for and I realised I also forgot to introduce it just now. It stands for the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Quite a specific topic in the realm of biodiversity and conservation but even though it's a bit unfamiliar or niche, like wildlife trade is actually quite common in our daily lives. It's like the American ginseng that's sold at TCM. Like all these products are regulated um, by CITES 
And it's very difficult and very complex when you talk about wildlife trade because you're also talking about the communities who harvest these resources and have gained livelihoods out of it. Also about national economies. And then you're also trying to balance like these considerations with conservation priorities as well. And so what we hope to do with CGYN is to bridge the knowledge gap and to help youth understand like all these different dimensions to the issue of wildlife trade, which is quite an important piece of like the biodiversity conservation puzzle um, and other puzzles as well, like sustainable development. If you overharvest, then you also cannot have long-term sustainable like growth. And I think for all of us, like our experiences in regional collaborations have also um, underscored the importance of empathy. And I hope that by increasing understanding of like the different perspectives of where different people come from in different parts of the world, then we can better understand each other and then we can have better knowledge and empathy and have a nuanced and constructive position to contribute to society's discussions and conservation problems and yeah, fight against illegal wildlife trade. And I hope that through this, then also youths can have a seat at the table uh, meaningfully because they also understand what's going on and decision makers and policy makers will also see youths um, as a grounded and informed stakeholder in the decisions that they make at the international and national level. I think you guys will, will have like day jobs that are like going to be related to conservation. I think for myself, it's about contributing to conservation outside of my day job. So um, I try to do that by going on many like regional trips. For instance, we just returned from a fulfilling experience in Bali. In the first leg of our trip, we worked closely with a local banja, which is a village in Tulamban, to develop a new coastal reef. So this will actually uh, promote the spawning of giant clams, restore reef connectivity, and it will actually build a new dive site and attraction for tourists. So more importantly, the project's intent is to create additional and alternative sources of revenue for the local community. And of course, the diving is amazing as always. In the second lake, uh, we work with Bali Reptile Rescue, which is a local wildlife rescue and rehab organization focused on rescues, education and outreach, as well as research. There was a poignant moment that I encountered, which has been on my mind. So while we were there at the Wildlife Rescue Center, a barn owl was sent in and its prognosis was terrible because it had been shot in the wing and it was fractured and the muscle was dying. Yeah, so the vet actually had to make a decision to put it down. Uh, I opted to stay on in the room to watch as they ended his life humanely and they were praying and apologizing to it and he hoped that it's so fine peace. Yeah, we managed to observe uh, an instance of human wildlife conflict in Bali because right one side is that the barn owls are trained and sold to farmers to control the rat population in farmlands but nobody can control that these owls are also naturally drawn to and fly to swiftlet houses where they predate on the birds. So this causes the swiftlet nest farmers to retaliate. This was quite a sensitive encounter of the result of human wildlife conflict and I think it needs a very sensitive balance. Okay, let's share about some challenges that are unique to young people who want to contribute to biodiversity conservation, especially within Southeast Asia. Challenges. Uh, I think for me, there are two challenges that young people face when they are eager to contribute to conservation. The first, I think, even though there are avenues in Singapore to contribute, I found that when I wanted to contribute to an overseas project, there were not many options available. So I wish there would be more interconnectedness between Singapore and other countries perhaps taking the form of regional internship and attachment programs. Um, the other area, which my peers feel is a challenge, would be the lack of good environmental mentors in Singapore. I was fortunate to have outstanding mentors such as Dr. Adrian Liu and Dr. Jessica Lee, who has taken the time to nurture me. But my peers have shared that they're not as lucky to have someone spend time, guide, critique, and advise their career moves. This support system, I think, is key if we want to retain youths in the biodiversity scene. Um, seeing that it's such a small and niche community already. Yeah, I agree. Actually, mentors are really important. And I only encountered like good mentors, you know, when I reached university. And he was crucial to me, like publishing, like for example, eating chili crab in the Anthropocene, as well as my final year manuscript into like a research journal. I think without his push, right, I, it wouldn't have uh, happened. La. Yeah, because you need someone to like tell you that you need to shape the potential by being disciplined and publishing it, which, uh, which is a long journey, right? Because each piece takes about one and a half years to two years from the first draft to completion and publication. Yeah, actually, I also agree with both of you guys about the point of mentors. Like, I was also very um, thankful to have a good mentor who believed in me and who gave me a chance. So actually for World Wildlife Day, right, um, I planned the one in 2023 after Waikit who planned it in 2022. 
And because of COVID, Why Kids 1 was on Zoom. And in 2023, I think restrictions were slowly easing. And so the possibility of in-person travel was starting to come back. And so we were very, very keen to have an in-person symposium because the aim of WWD is to grow a community of regional youths who are passionate for conservation and also to connect them with mentors in the region. What better way to connect youths um, and mentors with each other other than an in-person setting? So that's what we, me and my team like strongly believed in. But an in-person symposium is very, very logistically challenging and it's a lot more work than an online um, event. And so I think initially my mentor was a bit skeptical, um, but she still gave us a chance and she was like, okay, you write me a proposal, I will see how. And so we did. We wrote her like a very, very, very long proposal. And after that, she read through everything and she seriously considered our idea. And then after that, she she took a step of faith and then she believed in us. And so WWD um, 2023 was an in-person symposium and we had like more than 170 youths um, from Singapore and from all ASEAN countries um, come to learn together and to make friends um, and to just talk about conservation with one another. Yeah, so so coming back to the question, I really agree with both of you guys that um, having a good mentor is important. Like for Waikid, your mentors have pointed you in the right direction. For Sarin, they have also encouraged you and advised you in a way that helps you reach your fullest potential. And for me, my mentor was really kind to believe in me um, and my team and take a step of faith. But next question that I have is, how can you find such a good mentor in Southeast Asia? Hmm. You know, I really think as a youth, you really have to just put yourself out there. And so for me, it's, you know, joining the school environmental CCA. It's joining some MPARC event, going to dialogues and discussions, um, even though you might think that it's a waste of time, but it actually isn't, you know. Um, there are things that you can learn from it. I think there are also a lot of other avenues, right? You have things like nature khakis, you have things like reef acts, um, fish acts, even for the marine scene. And then there's bird society now. There's also things like herpetological society. So there's so many places that you can go into. Once you get in there, there are so many more mentors in there. And so I think not so much on the technical side, but we need to start relationship building. Yeah, I agree. I think for, for me, when I was in school, it was quite easy to find a mentor because like you are surrounded by professors and you're surrounded by seniors who are also keen on the same topic. So it's all about just attending courses and then maybe afterwards you go to like uh, after office hours or you when you're working on a project, you just uh, interface more like directly with the prof, right? Take that as an opportunity to engage the prof on the topic. But I think for me, like now, because I've graduated for like more than four years, it's actually difficult to find a mentor, right, in, in my space. So actually, I, I've been doing what Waikiki is doing, which is to go for all these community events and to make friends with people in the space. Because in some way, everybody in the space has something to teach you. Like they are your friend, but they are also your mentor. Like you have something to learn from them. So for example, from my good friend, like Wen Yu or Dockers, I've learned about the interface between like mental health, art and environmentalism. Yeah, and, and I, I think I have that like little takeaway from everyone that I meet including like doing this podcast right like everybody that I met uh, that's why I was so keen on the podcast I feel like everybody that I met on, on the podcast would teach me something about wildlife that I never knew before yeah I think I think you know networking in the past have a very like negative connotation to it um, but and I still feel that it is so I feel like what we have to do is relationship building not networking for the sake of networking and just making connections for personal gain you know um, I think it has to advance society in a way that is going to be more collaborative in the future yeah, I guess it's a give and take. As much as you can learn from someone else, I'm sure we also have different experiences or we can help others in some other way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really agree with you guys that like it's important to get involved. And platforms that I have experienced to help me find mentors um, and friends to learn from is WWD and like YSN, which is the Youth Stewards for Nature program. So World Wildlife Day Regional Youth Symposium is actually a YSN project. Um, and that's where I got to meet my mentor. I think that traditionally YSN was just very Singapore-centric. It was very Singapore-based projects. Mm -hmm. So when MPOX asked me to um, you know, organize the first World Wildlife Day um, regional youth symposium, I was like, wow, how come Singapore YSN want to do regional projects really? So I saw it as a way of reaching out and really engaging um, you know, and working with the regional community, which I was all for. And so 
from local to regional and then now we're going global with the Cypress Global Youth Network, I think that is the right direction that Singapore is moving toward. I think like jump off a point that I think Steffi mentioned, right, which is like about how we are also now sort of in a position to mentor or to like like contribute, right? Because we're now older than younger youth. Oh, <laughs> yes, no. yes. Older. and I feel no. I feel that way, especially when I uh, work on Untamed Paths and uh, we get interns now. Surprising, mm. these people are like so young. Um, and I think I think these interns have much to like that other youths can do, right? Which is like, they have this like sense of proactivity to do research on what are the local wildlife groups that they can potentially join to reach out like, uh, you know, via a nice like crafted email, send us their CVs and we can like review these uh, CVs and see whether they fit the company, whether their motivations and their interests can like translate into something with us. So for example, through that, right, they can do like guiding with us, they can organize projects with us. I think in, in this way, right, we are also able to like more directly contribute to the uh, personal and environmental journey of one youth and we've been doing that since uh, 2022 which is I think it's quite a fulfilling work for both Dennis and I to be able to be in this position I think like we stumbled upon it but we quite enjoy it yeah <laughs> so after I organized the inaugural World Wildlife Day um, the next year was Steffi's batch and so while I was interning at MPAX I was tasked to bring the next team on board I was asked to put out applications, but I didn't really put out applications, you know. I was just, like, directly reaching out to potential youths that we see um, are doing good work and are getting actively involved. Um, and so we reached out to them um, personally and we had a pizza party. I think only three people couldn't make it, um, couldn't join a team, but the rest of them, a team of 16, I think, um, joined us. And so that was the regional side. And then same for this year, Scientist Global Youth Network, when we're going to have the event in April, we are... Again, reaching out to specific youths who we know are committed, who are active, who are, you know, trying to push the limit and then help mentor them, put them in direct contact with people like Dr. Adrian and Dr. Jess. So before we continue, it's time for our Fun Me episode break. So this is the segment where we'll share something interesting, wow or wonderful about biodiversity that you may not have known before. Okay, so my fun fact is about elephants. Did you know elephants can't jump? <laughs> Unlike many other mammals, right? Elephants are so heavy and their body structure just physically can't jump. Can you imagine? Can you visualize an elephant trying to jump in your head? I think they'll look freaking cute. So I think we need a GIF or like an emoji of like elephant jumping. I want I want that as like a sticker, you know, I can send. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm trying to jump but I cannot jump. <laughs> My fun fact is about ants. Do you know that after ants like die, they release a pheromone, which is kind of like a smell. Um, that tells other ants that they are dead. And so then the other worker ants will carry the dead ant to like a dumping site, like a burial ground. And if you're a living ant and you so happen to have this pheromone of the dead ant, like the other worker ants will still carry you alive to the dumping site of dead ants. Yeah, very cool. How about yours, Sarin? <laughs> yeah, and my fun fact about sea slugs, so they're able to decapitate themselves means like they chop off their own heads, right? When they're infected by parasites. Yeah, and after some time, they're able to regrow their entire body. For example, when they are healthy again or when there's food again in the ecosystem. That's crazy. You know, I love sea slugs. I love nudibranchs because when I was diving in Sipidan um, in December, uh, we saw so many of them and they're so colourful, right? And then there are some with like those spikes behind their backs. It's because when they eat like all the polyps of um, sea anemones, right? They take in those poison darts. And so if you go and touch some of these sea sucks, right, you will get uh, like, you know, stung by them. So I didn't know that. So they took like over the properties like a Pokemon, you know, or like those weird mythical creatures, you absorb a property <laughs> of another creature and then I fact you use it as a defensive mechanism. Crazy, yeah. huh? The same sea slug is able mm. to take in the chloroplast from the food that it eats and incorporate into its own body. So it's basically solar powered. What? The same sea slug that decapitates its head. Why are humans not solar powered? Yeah. Sea slugs are cool. I eat so much veggie. Why am I not solar powered? That's wild. As youths who have committed a lot of time and effort to this space, right? I want to ask, like, why do you think it's important for youths to be involved in biodiversity conservation, both locally and across the region? I think for me, I connect it back to my experience when I was in Panama for Cites Corp. When I was there, I was, I think, one of two to three youths that I saw there um, at the government level making decisions for wildlife across the world. I found that it was, you know, it was interesting. It felt um, a little um, hard to grasp, but even more so than I was like, you know, we need more youths in this scene. So I believe that youths are really our future and I want to enable the generational change required for our youths to solve the problems that we are unable to. 
So co-founding the Youth Network is one of them. So I really believe that what Steffi mentioned before, if we are going to make friends with our biodiversity youths in the region, there is a likelihood that we will rise to leadership and decision-making positions in the future to challenge the status quo, right? So that when we have an issue, I can just text my friend, for example. I don't have to go through back and forth um, hundreds of emails, right? So diplomacy, or I think nicely put, friendship must start at a young age um, if we're going to create a better world for biodiversity conservation. I think for me, I care because biodiversity is very interesting. That's like the diversity is just so mind blowing and so intriguing to me. But maybe everyone can have a different reason for being involved in conservation because this issue is so intersectional. It links to climate change, food security, cultural heritage and communities, like people who experience these on a day-to-day basis. And I think because youth care intrinsically for a better future, I think getting involved in conservation might be one way that they can help to channel their concern and their desire to act for good and for a better future. Yeah, I was recently introduced by a final year student in Yeo Nguyen. So basically, she was asking me to narrate my whole story from when I was young. And I realized that it was from like growing up, going to zoos and to farmlands in Cha Chukang that started this whole journey, right? And then afterwards, um, when I was in secondary school, I started by contributing to like more like, I would say social issues. So like elderly, like young people, muscular dystrophy, right? And then um, I think only when I went to Yeo Nguyen and I found like a good avenue for contributing to environmentalism and I met like people in uh, Yonia's IDCO, which is like the similar like, environmental movement to NUS SAFE, the I like transition to en- en- environmentalism, right? And I think coupled with that was that in uh, Intro to ES, uh, our prof talked about how like environmentalism is intersectional and like it links across many different topics, right? Which is what Steffi said also. So when I, when I learned that, that line or that concept, I think it was really just in my head, like theoretical. And I just memorized it because it was on the exam, like, we will solve environmentalism by working intersectionally, something like that. But I think it's only through like going through this process um, and finding that I could very easily transition from social issues to environmental issues that I realized that, oh, it really is this umbrella to me in my mind that really allows me to connect everything together. Yeah. You know, I think that school is such an amazing place for us to test our boundaries, right? It's a place where we can make mistakes and we are, we are still forgiven. I think there was this one very good example um, in NUS SAFE. In the past, it was the Students Against Violation of the Earth. Now it's Students Associations for Visions of the Earth. Um, so it changed. Yeah. So yes, in the past, yes, there yes, was this very yes. interesting um, <laughs> case where um, some students came across a paradise tree snake that was slithering across um, a road. And so they called security, security came. And security's first response was to call pest control instead of, acres or you know and parks and so pest control got there first unfortunately i think about 10 minutes early and then they sprayed insecticide on the paradise tree snake and so acres came 10 minutes later they picked it up they saw what was happening they took it to their rescue center they tried to attend to it but it lost its life unfortunately and so when this was brought to my attention i was like no way this is happening on nus straight away we um, in nus safe we drafted this um, open letter um, and so the UCI, the University Campus Infrastructure, um, they got back to me um, because they are in charge of all the um, contract staff, the security, pest control, etc. And so what we did was we formed the Campus Wildlife Task Force. And so we created new SOP to put in place. So now if you go down to NUS and you ask any security guard, what should you do when you see a wildlife? Mm-hmm. The procedure should be in place already, which is number one, make sure that Students are not too close to the wildlife. Everybody stay at a safe distance. And then after that, contact acres or parks. Um, and then we also change the contract for all the pest control companies, right? We make sure that those who are going to be hired have gone through MPARC certification. Because MPARC wildlife management have certification, right? For handling reptiles, handling cats, dogs, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so we revamped the entire thing and then we went ahead. So to do that, right, we brought in acres, MPARCs, um, Prof. Siva, we brought in everybody to just brainstorm and get it done. I think that it does feel a bit like run and gun in uni. Yeah. yeah. You know, I prefer that youths act on what they talk about or what they learn in class in theory. I would rather they act on it instead of just talking and talking and talking and complaining and complaining. Then who's going to do it, right? 
So you can keep talking and talking, but if no one's going to do it, then you can just keep complaining all you want, but things will never get better. So you got to take some sort of responsibility for what you are talking about as well. I think Therese, Therese as in president of SYCA, recently yeah. asked Dr. Janu in a civil society like forum about the role of civil society, right? Like whether is it like a place for criticism or a place to be a technical like expert, you know, to provide technical solutions. And uh, she was like saying like where, like on this spectrum, like where should Singapore civil society stand? And Dr. Janu just said both, like a bit of both, which is not too much criticism but also not really all about technical solutions because ultimately civil society won't know everything we won't have the complete picture right so it's always like supplementing the government's already like they already have knowledge so we supplement that but we also provide criticism if we think that the final proposal is not like as constructive as it should be yeah Yeah, and I think at least for in Singapore's case when the youths are frustrated or when we have ideas it is honestly taken up by the government so not later they listen It is a lot easier. I mean, even though our listeners may not believe it, but when you go and meet the youth in the region or across the world, oh, the story is so much different. You can make all the noise you want. You will never hear or you'll never get an email back at all. Um, So I think that we need to acknowledge how fortunate we are being in Singapore, being a youth in Singapore, being able to create change. Um, So yeah, I don't know. My advice to youths, get out there and start doing things. Yes, so apart from university, for our listeners who are interested in contributing to conservation but unsure where to start, do we have any advice for them? I think CCAs in school is a fantastic place to start. I think there's this new movement at the grassroots level called Nature Khakis. So while I was an intern at MParks, um, that was something that we worked on starting. So every different grassroots across Singapore, you get to you know, join a green and environmental program and you just run whatever sustainability or wildlife projects. There's Singapore Youth Voices for Biodiversity. There is Bird Society, Herpetological Society. If you're interested in marine, I think there is Reef X. There's also Fish X nowadays. I think for me, I really echo the the point about joining CCAs in school or like clubs. So if you're in school, look for your your school's chapter of the environmental movement. Yeah. So I think in NUS, there's NUS Safe. Then NTU, there's Earthling. And SMU, there's Verts. There's this new movement um, between collaborations between the schools. The IUEC, the Inter-Uni Environmental Coalition, right? So they bring together everyone yeah. like NUS Safe, yes. M- um, NTU, etc. And so... It's actually quite good because it's supported by the Prime Minister's office. They fund a bit of it, they run activities, they support us manpower-wise as well. I think if you're interested, you can just start somewhere. Like, I think now there's a lot more social media content or videos and books that talk about environmental conservation. So you can start by reading those. I think in Singapore, there are organisations like Singapore Youth Voices for Biodiversity, Lepak in SG, who have been putting a lot of effort to also share this knowledge online through social media. And the people in our local environmental organisations are usually quite nice. So I think just don't be scared. You can also like approach them like through social media or just in person to just ask how you can contribute. I'm sure anyone would be happy to point you the right way. Yeah, especially because I think not all your podcast guests are getting older. I think just any youth can just reach out to us, reach out to groups like Dante Paths and then ask for advice, ask for help. Recently, someone from Fish X re- uh, reached out and it was like, yeah, why kid, how do I um, reach out to NUS and you know spread the word of like this program that I'm doing? I was like, don't worry, I'll help you. Um, so, you know, just reach out to people and then you won't know how gracious and you know kind they are. And with that, we've come to the end of our episode and the end of this season. Thank you, Steffi and Waikit, for joining us today. More information on YSN, WWD, and other programs mentioned in our conversation can be found on our episode show notes. Do leave your thoughts on this episode on Park Socials and give us a follow if you've enjoyed the content. My name is Tarin and thank you so much for listening to That's Wow. Whee! Bye! Bye! That's wow. <laughs>